Okay, uh, I'm going to start off with a uh, quote by William Blake, which kind of sets the tone for how I was, uh, how I got into this. Uh, to be in a passion, good may do, but no good if a passion is in you, from auguries of innocence. It would be easy when talking about the highs, hows and whys of my work, and perhaps preferable to some, to focus on some of the technical parlor tricks, give all the credit to the computer and printer, and be done with it. I wish it was that easy. The truth is, the computer only serves as another hand. It easily makes marks and shapes, which can then be colored and textured. Colors can be changed with one stroke of the mouse, but like the hand, the computer is controlled by the mind of its operator. <clears throat> what I choose is an indication of what I see. My work seems to evolve as if by natural selection and chance, but it is really through my choices, not those of the computer or nature, that my work is made. As I use filters, layers, and adjustments in Photoshop, I am constantly deciding what is good or bad, what colors work, and how to move in the desired direction, always with an eye for composition, which may come out of a concept, but more likely be determined by what I, what I see happening. By working in this manner, I come up with images I could never have preconceived in thought. Thought changed the infinite to a serpent, that which pitieth to a devouring flame. William Blake. So how did, how did I go from the computer to the prints? It's all, it's all in your head as the saying goes. Three days after the start of the year 2011 and the beginning of uh, a semester-long sabbatical, my son Jarrett died of an overdose of heroin. Needless to say, I was devastated and my life was turned upside down. After a period of mourning and anger, of thrashing around in my head for answers, I turned to my art as is my custom in times of severe emotional upheaval. I wasn't out to make pretty pictures or turn the art world on its ear. I just wanted to yell as loud as I could, scream to the heavens of my anguish. I wanted to find something that would heal this wound to my being. In the small circle of pain within the skull, you shall tramp and tread one endless round of thought to justify your actions to yourself, weaving a fiction which unravels as you weave, pacing forever in a hell of make-believe which never is belief, from Murder in the Cathedral by T.S. Eliot. <clears throat> I first looked into myself. It must have been my fault. I should have done more. I took some headshots, some self-portraits, a snapshot of my son in the Grand Canyon, the one in the dedication page over by the door, uh, taken several years before, the last time the two of us spent any time alone together and put all these in Photoshop and immerse myself in months of manipulating, reducing, layering, trying to find out, find some combination that would assuage my pain. The only thing that helped was to mediate, was to meditate upon the, result, the resultant 3D spaces. 
but I was far from anything that could be called healed. <clears throat> I go forth from my hiding place only to stay hidden. I leave this lonely place only to remain alone. I move out of loneliness only to find panic. This was where I was at when my attention was subsequently diverted by setting up the Japanese print show last fall here in the gallery. The prints afforded me some solace, some insight into how others, in this case from a completely alien culture to my own, dealt with upheaval, war, loss, and death. What was <clears throat> represented in these prints was a loss of a way of life, of traditions, a, a rending apart and rebuilding of a whole society. All this through simplified forms, layered spaces, textures, line, and bright colors. Any powerful work of art invades our being and changes it forever. Art is the most ingressive, transformative summons available to human experiencing. It is an intrusive, invasive indiscretion that queries the last privacies of our existence, an enunciation that breaks into the small house of our cautionary being so that it no longer so that it is no longer habitable in quite the same way as it was before. It is a transcendent encounter that tells us, in effect, change your life. From Wait, the myth of Atlas and, Hercule and Heracles by Janet Winterston. Winterson. Well, change I did. I went back to my own work and looked afresh at what I had done in the previous months. I saw too much confusion, little clarity, and the glasses didn't afford me the space I was seeking. In the history of art, a good part of the past 150 years or so has been devoted to the reduction and simplification of form and trying to go below the surface of the skin. Cezanne, Van Gogh, Kokoschka, Picasso, Matisse, Pollock, Warhol, Johns, to name a few. Ever since college, I have worked at this understanding, this simplification, from Bacon-esque watercolors of bums and the commons and monk monkish trees along the river to hard-edged colored canvases, then back to basics through simple renderings of a conch shell. Once I accepted the aesthetic of the digital media and stopped trying to make it into something else, like a photograph, a drawing, a painting, then I began to truly create in this new art form. At first, I expected the media to conform to my expectations. It's only when I looked at it for what it was and used it as such that I was able to go somewhere with it. I started reducing <clears throat> the layered images of my son and me, crop, then enlarge, reduce with filters and adjustments, reduce the size of the image, apply filters, and then return to the larger image, cut and splice, enlarge again. These new images blew me away with their impact. The space began to open up, bright colors layered into softer tones in combination with highly saturated bits of color floating in space in front of and behind other bits of color. I never knew what to expect when I printed the large images since I was working from a tiny uh, image on the screen. Even blowing the images up on the monitor to actual print size wouldn't allow me to anticipate the overall effect. The last temptation is the greatest treason, to do the right deed 
for the wrong reason. Again, from Murder in the Cathedral by T.S. Eliot. With Blake and Eliot ringing in my ears, I constantly question my motives, the results, my feelings. What the hell was I doing this for? Was this simply a way of getting my visual rocks off? Which incidentally seems to be how many artists today justify their work. The how is easy, the layering and manipulation of marks and images. Simple Photoshop adjustments, though perhaps uh, simply photo Photoshop adjustments, though perhaps carried out in rather unorthodox ways. Since I had never studied the program, Photoshop, and had no idea what all the adjustments were meant for, I developed rather extreme ways of pushing the cursor all the way over and taking the applications to their limits usually to the detriment of my computer. The contra uh, contrast, hard over, moved the colors towards the primaries and brought up the blacks. The median filter, pushed way over, reduces the image to a blur blurry mass, to be followed by smart sharp filter to draw out the simplified forms. While most people are content to work the image in a constant size, I reduce the size down to, for instance, two inches by two inches, apply the filter, and then enlarge the image back to its original dimensions, thus ending up with quite a different result uh, from uh, the filter. The why is always the hardest to explain the layering of motives, ideas, and theories, and expression of feelings, of joy, pain, and amazement, a love of the visual space created. What explains all this away is the glasses. When I discovered them 10 years ago, I realized the missing element in my work, the space that gave meaning to everything I did the pensive, melancholy, chaotic, layered, confused, and rainy space in my mind that defined my thoughts and feelings and showed me, allowed me to see and realize those thoughts, bringing them up from, bef from beneath layers of neurons to whatever con uh, consciousness I could piece together. People ask why I, wanted to, I want to work in 3D. One reason is to access that part of the brain's function that deals with depth perception. The fact that we have two eyes, unlike perspective drawings, which rely on knowledge, stereoscopic vision is experiential and relies on the inherit, inherited concept within the brain that processes two images into one in three dimensions. If you damage that part of your brain that processes color, it's as if the color doesn't exist. So too, if you take away one eye or restrict either's <clears throat> ability to see, poof, there's no three dimension. Out of sight, out of mind. We see, therefore it exists. I can't look at a flat image the way I see the world around me which is closer to my reality than shapes on a piece of paper. <clears throat> when I see in true 3D, I focus as though I would be, I would, as though I were, were viewing an object in the room. The rest blurs out, but not the same as in a photo. What I don't see doesn't exist, only what I see does. I have always been fascinated with the many dualities uh, we're confronted with. A perfect example of this is uh, perspective. How we see versus what we know. You're looking down a road, you see the telephone poles diminish in size, though you know they're all the same size. You see them in different sizes, you know they're the same. Other examples include how an actual event is transformed into a myth actual versus the myth. 
Both can be just as true. The artist versus the scientist. Both can be right. Viewing the same image with or without the glasses showing different realities for each from the same image. I have done research into brain function and how the mind works. Recent electronic imaging, MRIs, CAT scans, etc., has allowed scientists to view the actual functioning of the brain, reactions to given stimuli, to determine which part of the brain does what. Studying vision in particular has afforded scientists with many insights into brain function. Processing stereoscopic vision, amazingly enough, has been focused on to give an idea of how other parts work. How do we conceive in three dimensions? How do we create these incredible images in our mind? We have two eyes that were bequeathed to us by the monkeys high in the trees jumping from one leafy branch to another with no room for error. Depth perception was critical and became highly developed. Their brain size increased considerably due to this. It was passed on to us, this extra brain capacity, and we further developed it into precision motor skills, allowing us to fabricate and manufacture our world today. The thinking and conceiving was a byproduct of the seeing. Light is reflected off a surface and passes into the retina of the beholder. The rods and cones send information to the primary visual cortex. And I must say, and I add to this, that the image is upside down as it's being passed on. Uh, in the back, uh, the vi primary visual cortex in the back of the brain, which adds, acts as a clearinghouse where it is related to the centers of what, what the object is, and where, where the, where the object is in relationship to the viewer. We scan the object one part at a time, a fixation period between scans, and these are all very extremely short. A fixation period between scans allows us to consciously take in what we see. We are now alert to what we are looking at. The eyes are taking it in while the brain directs. Where do we look? How do we choose what we look at? In understanding this, we begin to see how we got where we are. And I quote, it is, high, it is high level vision, visual processing that leads to conscious visual perceptions and interpretation of, of meaning. From Age of Insight by Eric Kandel. Information is brought in from other areas to help interpret what we're seeing. A simple object on the table can take on many levels of significance depending upon the individual viewer, the circumstances, what the object is, where it is, what's going around it, both past and present. Our perceptions bring together much information, including personal experience, especially personal experience to determine what we see and how to proceed. We use templates, if you will, to help identify. Hand, we understand by this. The foreshortened hand, like this, presents greater problems. By circumventing our templates, the artist can avoid the what or identification the where, without the what, affords the artist the ability to see the shapes, colors, and values for what they are in space without the inconvenience of having to know what it is, and thus having to fit it into those mental boxes. This helps him to draw or paint what he sees, not what he thinks. Art takes, on, takes the normal processes and turns them on their head. It accesses the unconscious loop, it stops time, and places the viewer in an alien place of wonder. As the jaw drops and the color 
the colors and shapes come into focus, the mind is transported away from or into the grief and loss, loneliness and despair, the shame and guilt, the anger and desire for revenge. These are still here, still real, but now balanced by colors floating in space in front of other colors, receding back across textured planes or shapes surging and entwined, separating into negative spaces that look through to other shapes. It is because of the grief that the colors are so beautiful. It is because of the colors that the pain no longer, no longer takes over the canvas of our being. It is the grief and pain of others, or perhaps only the anxiety, that allows the artist to communicate this most, most powerful remedy. Thank you. I thought I'd, I'd read this first and then uh, so we could kind of open it up to questions and discussion because I'd much rather talk that way than, than give a speech, as you can probably tell. <laughs> so if you guys have any questions, anything that you, yes? I was just wondering if you could give us a run through how you create it and how you print it. Um, well, as I mentioned, um, I took a photograph of my son and a few uh, photographs of myself, and I started to layer them in Photoshop. I started to uh, break them down using the various filters and um, um, adjustments and so forth in Photoshop. And then I, uh, and and then in the process, I'd be cropping and blowing up or or uh, splicing things together and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, I would do this with the glasses on, uh, which was the whole purpose was to uh, explore the space and to try to discover new, the new spaces. And um, once I found an image that I wanted, um, then I would save it. And uh, in the show here, there are uh, three different um, forms of display. Uh, actually two different uh, forms of printing. The first is uh, just using an Epson uh, inkjet printer with archival inks, uh, which I did myself. And then the other is there, are, I think there are eight um, prints in here that are from a place called Magnachrome in California, which will go through a process of infusing the inks onto the uh, surface of the aluminum. And uh, it makes a very, very strong surface. And you can, I can take those and I can throw them in the, in the bathtub and nothing will happen to them. So, How did you make the, the line of prints? Now, I printed that in the, in the same printer. Um, and uh, I just, uh, I've, unfortunately, I, it was going to be a circular print. But I couldn't find the plastic, and so and so I was stuck with just half a print. And uh, the uh, I finally found a place in Phoenix that uh, sold the plastic. And um, and then I had uh, a local sign place mounted onto the plastic for me. Thank you. The, yeah. No, uh, that, that's not the one right around the corner here. Yeah, that one is. Uh, uh, this one isn't even in the show. <laughs> no, no, none of the, none of the long ones are. Uh, it's just the smaller ones. Uh, the two on the back side of that of the far wall there are. Um, there's one on the back side of this wall. We, they're all on the back sides of everything. Uh, but it doesn't matter how they're printed as far as the three-dimensional effects are concerned. 
Um, the only difference is that the color changes slightly. As you change the, the form of it, you go from this to the printed, uh, the printed piece, you'll see, you'll, you can see dramatic differences. Um, and that will, that will vary your vis the visual experience because the glasses are completely, sent I mean, that's how they work. They work on color. And so you change the colors even slightly and that changes the form of it a little bit. Um, it stays fairly close. The Magnachrome uh, really beefs up the saturation and um, I'm still trying to get used to it because it, it does away with a lot of the subtlety of the uh, regular printing. So you, you lose a lot of the grays and a lot of the, you know, the gray blues become blue. Uh, you know, the gray greens become green, that kind of stuff. So, anyway. Hey, Steve? Yeah. How did you create the image itself, like on that long one right there? Is that all computer generated or yes. did you paint that or? Um, in a, in a few, at, a, at certain times, I would print something and I would paint on it and then I'd scan it or photograph it, put it back in the computer. Um, like, like something like that long one. That, that was, that was uh, well, like I say, I'd, I'd probably done the painting and stuff <laughs> earlier and I was still sort of developing or working on top of this, this whole show is a whole series. So what I did in the beginning influenced everything that went all the way through. So I did do some painting, but uh, by the time I got to that, it was almost, I did, the whole image was pretty much in the computer. And it was, it was a real challenge to uh, figure out how to, um, it was a real challenge to see it because, you know, my little screen is like this and I'm trying to look at something that's 20 feet long. I was just curious how you could make a computer make it look so much like paint. Oh. You know, with all those little dabs and things, you know. That, uh, that was just the result of, uh, it was actually the median filter where I was just reducing it way down. And, and so it just didn't, it was, and actually it was, just wasn't getting rid of all the noise. <laughs> So these, these are all just a bunch of knives, don't they? Pretty much. <laughs> yes. Do you feel you get a better effect when you start with your own painting or when you start having the computer generate the image? Uh, I, I love the drawing and the painting. Um, and it's a, it's a wild experience because you're sitting there with paint of one color and you're putting it against a, a canvas of another color and you're either sitting there going like this and nothing happens because you don't know where the surface is. This is with the glasses on. Or you go and you push the brush through the canvas because you think the canvas is way over here. So that it's a real challenge. And I love doing it that way. The problem is that when, uh, because these things are so color sensitive, you have to constantly be working on the colors and changing the colors. And you can be doing that for a year before you get it right. In the computer, you just move the cursor a little bit and all the colors change. And so you can change the colors so much more efficiently uh, in the computer. And I can, do in, uh, I can do in a day what it would take me a year to do painting in terms of, of creating images. Do you need a special computer, I mean a high-speed computer to do this? <laughs> Don't I wish. <laughs> I know Photoshop takes forever sometimes. Yeah. Um, kind of a silly question, but each individual painting, if you have like its own emotional component just attached to it, because I noticed like each painting has its own sort of direction, and some are a lot, you know, stiffer with the shapes than they are. Like someone mentioned earlier, they have the the dots of the paint, and and um, was that part of your mindset when you were I try not to have a mindset. I try to push aside everything I, I, I'm thinking. And I just respond uh, to what's going on. Um, 
obviously what's, what's inside of me is coming out in one form or other because of all the decisions. Every decision I make, that's, that's being exercised. Um, I, don't, I don't plan on anything. I mean, I'm not sitting there feeling bad and want to paint something that expresses how I feel bad. Um, the, um, um, I think some of you are probably tired of hearing me tell this, tell this thing, I usually tell most of my classes. Uh, uh, Stephen King has a book on, on writing. It's a fabulous book if you ever get a chance to read it. And especially if you can get the audio version because he, he narrates it himself. And it's about how he makes his books. And it's basically how you make art. And it's a wonderful, uh, I mean, it really breaks down all the different components in making a painting, a, a, a book, anything like that. And one of the questions he's constantly asked is, how do you plan your plots? And he says, I don't. I don't believe in plot planning. I set up a situation, and I let it run. I see where it goes. And that's essentially, and, I, and when I read that, I said, oh, man, finally. <laughs> Somebody who feels as I do, because that's how I, that's how I like to work. I like to just set up a situation and then see what happens. And that's basically what I've done. When you're originating by, by kind of fine art means, do you change your environment around to see if it actually affects the debt budget or your uh, and what do you mean by environment? Well, it, for instance, if, you, if you're changing the, the lights around and where they're at and where they're striking your medium, or changing the, the, the chroma and the color, yes. thus kind of affecting the, the depth, I would assume, yes. because the, the, you're saying the pigment is what gives you the depth budget in the final print, correct? Mm -hmm. So do you change your environment around as that kind of as I'm working? Is it kind of like, I'm going to do this to like see what happens when you're doing it? Um, I don't because the only thing I'm looking at is this. I'm just looking at the screen. And so I can turn on lights. I can have somebody playing the Star Spangled Banner, and it doesn't matter. This is what I'm seeing. Um, I can change the background here. I can change that part of it. So instead of against black, it's against gray or white or some color. But um, not while I'm working. The finished product is, is another story, because I have to consider how it's going to be presented. And presentation has always been kind of a, a problem for me. Lighting, you can see kind of a, a mixture of lighting here. Some of it's really good, and some of it, it it's kind of spotty. So, um, but. That having been said, you still get the effect of of the image. So you don't you you you, uh, you don't paint anything and then transfer it to this. Is that, I, I, that's kind of what I was talking about. Is the painting? Oh, paint when I'm transfer? when I was painting, um, yeah. I I I never was really thinking about it. I mean, I always I always had good light. You have to have, to see this stuff. You need a lot of light. Um, you turn the lights down, and it, it, you you lose a lot of the effect. Yes. Is anybody else doing anything like this out in the art world? I'm always asked this, but I have no idea. I don't know of anybody. I get the magazines and stuff. There was an ar an article in the New York Times this weekend that uh, this that was celebrating this guy that was doing these giant uh, digital prints, and everybody was going ooh and ah, had nothing to do with 3D. Um, and I'd love to get a hold of his printer sometime. But uh, that's, that's the only, I, I mean, I would, I just, I'm amazed. I mean, I'm just, I would think the market would be flooded with digital prints at this point. Um, artistic prints, not just digital photographs. But uh, there's very little. There, there are a couple of people who, who take advantage of it, but, uh, um, but not, 
I, I just don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I just did the work. I do the work. I've been doing this, you know, for 12 years now. And I don't, uh, I don't, I, if I worried about what other people were doing, I'd be, <laughs> be in an early grave. Yes? Uh, you, you were talking a little bit earlier how you kind of came to the end through an experimental uh, process or a kind of an intuitive or just a lot of decision making. It, it seemed like to me, you know, one of the limitations of the digital you know, world, and despite of how how much how uh, ubiquitous it is, how we see screens everywhere on phones and iPads, is that it's, it's two dimensional, and you know the light emitting diodes or the LCD screen. And mm -hmm. where I was wondering if you were consciously just trying to expand that uh, medium or that vocabulary at some point in the process, even though you were saying you were kind of kind of going there was a subconscious element or or something in response to an earlier question, where are you trying to expand the, the medium? Because that is a limitation, to us, you know, I, the, as opposed to you know more concrete or tactile uh, media you can work with. It's just yep. it's kind of contortion. Um, I am so very, very purposefully uh, uh, playing with the three the three D with the three dimensional aspect of the, yeah. I okay. mean that's okay. because that's as a I say concept. and that's what I, I right. said in this I said that you know it's the glasses right. that are kind of the unifying con uh, aspect of everything because oh. I work with the glasses on it shows me what's going on in the space and so I'm I'm not seeing a flat screen I'm seeing right. I'm seeing a three dimensional image if, that, uh, if that's what you're talking about it, it, you're just it seems like you're kind of expanding this two-dimensional world that a lot of us have and to that's, know and that's not, to live in. And it's not just the digital screen. It's paint screen. It's yeah. the photograph screen. It's, it's every, every flat surface. Right. But that I, I, I mean on the physical, when you, when you do apply physical paint to a canvas, it will come. It is three-dimensional, probably more so than a LCD screen. Um, you know? that, well, that's an interesting point because yes. I've always the been... Texture. I've, is yeah, I've always, I've always been very interested in printmaking, and um, and one of the one of my fascinations with printmaking is that the image is absolutely flat because it goes through two thousand pounds of pressure, and it is just squashed flat, and so everything that you're seeing on that piece of paper is optical, and the um, and the, it and this is the same way. Everything I see on that screen is optical. There's no, there's no parlor tricks as far as you know, creating big heavy textures and playing with the surface and doing all this other kind of stuff. Um, so I can I can really see what's going on uh, in terms of value and color and so forth um, without without the uh, without the the surface interfering. So that might be part of what you're talking. Yeah. Is it a given that certain colors are going to come forward and certain colors are going to recede and that you really can't, if like if a red comes forward, you can't make it recede or vice versa or you pretty much, Is certain colors go certain ways. Asset, I think is what he's saying. Okay. Um, if you look at the diagram there, it shows uh, how, the, how the wavelengths of color are refracted. Okay, how the color is refracted, and they're refracted in two different directions. The um, the reds, being the higher frequencies, will be refracted uh, the furthest out, which uh, which brings them closer in, and the blues are refracted closer in, which pushes them further back. That having been said, I've been able to do I've been able to push the blues for, bring the blues forward and I've been able to push the reds back. Uh, I have not gone into explaining the physics of how, of the difference of why I can do it in, in certain situations, and I can't, and in most other situations, I can't. So it's, uh, and that's part of why 
I try not to have too much of an agenda because I, I like to discover these things. I, like, I don't want to say, oh, well, red's going to come forward and blue's going to come back and just have that expectation all the time. I would rather be looking at what's happening on the screen and say, oh, wow, look at this, the blue's coming forward. Um, but, you know, if, as generally speaking, the reds come forward and the blues come back. If you're looking at a, at a two-dimensional painting, uh, m most often the aggressive reds are going to come out, are going to tend to come forward, and the blues are going to tend to be more re recessive and, and go back. Um, and that's without the glasses. So, you know, uh, I'm not, I, I just, I don't know enough to be able to tell you exactly why and in, under what circumstances you can reverse that. Well, well, these glasses are just prisms, right? Yes. So when you look through these, it's basically just shifting the image from one eye to the other? No. It's, as, as if you look over there, it's actually, re it's refracting the light in two different directions. Right, yeah. One way for one eye, and one way for the other eye. See, in order to see three dimensions, you have to have two separate images, okay? And that's why I turn to this, these particular glasses, because the glasses will do the separation. Whereas every other method that I ever tried, I had to create two completely different images in order to get the three dimensions. And that's, uh, and that's why I, I came to these glasses. And they're just, sold for par uh, you know, they're just sold for parties and things like that. I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing I ever saw. Because the, and the guy won't do anything with these things. He won't let anybody do anything with them. Um, so if you, if you know a good lawyer or are a good lawyer, and you know how to look at a, con how to look at a, um, a copyright or, or whatever and, and be able to find the loopholes, let me know. <laughs> Because I'd love to, I'd love to be able to uh, explore, or or work with some people who would who would uh, could explore these. Uh, you mean by changing the properties of the lenses? You could change the lenses. You could uh, you could get if you had sheets of this stuff. What would happen? I mean, what if what do you what happens if you're looking through a big sheet of this stuff, and and different you know and different placements and angles and all sorts. Yeah, because as I was walking around, I thought, wonder if you put a big sheet in front of one of these, would it still? Well, it would be like looking through one lens. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, but that having been said, they sell, um, they call, I can't remember what they call them. They call them clear view or something, I don't know. It's supposed to be clearer than with the two lenses. And what they do is they just have a, a, have a blank lens. Uh, just a clear lens that has no uh, refraction in it. And uh, you still see in 3D, it's clearer because the one eye that's not getting the refraction is able to focus, uh, get a clearer image. But uh, at the same time, you don't get quite as strong a 3D effect. But you do get a 3D effect. So again, I, I'd like to explore some of that stuff. The refraction is when the light waves then, right? Uh, are they altered from what they normally are? They're just separated. Oh, they're separated. Yeah, the different, the reds, yellows, and blues are all, you know, separated out. So you get, basically, you're creating a rainbow. Oh, I see. Which is why, if you look up at any of the lights here, you'll see rainbows. You know, it'll refract out. But the, the two lens, each lens are refracting differently. They're refracting in the opposite direction. Right, well, so you can hold it up and get a different, different rainbow. Yeah, and if you put them both on, if you put it on and you look through both of them, you'll see two rainbows. Don't look at the sun. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you guys need to be told not to look at the sun with these glasses on. <laughs> you can look at the sun without the glasses. <laughs> What about, uh, they now have 3D TV, but you don't need glasses to see three dimensions on it. Do you know if that works the same way? 
No, it doesn't. I mean, I, I'm not sure the, the uh, electronics of it, uh, but it's uh, it's different than this. So you have, you it's have more of a it's more of an in, a lenticular kind of process than. than when I was moving the big broadcast. You have one of your paintings or drawings on TV on a 3D TV. Would I see it in three dimensions? No. no? Okay. There you go. Yep. All you have to do is put the glasses on. You can see it in 3D. Well, that's why I don't have the 3D TV. I don't want to wear glasses. Yep. Steve, do you see yourself doing a more drawing in with this? Oh, yeah. I wish you could. Yeah. Because the ones with a little bit of drawing in it, they really... Yeah. Um, yeah, my, that's, that's one of my goals and directions, for sure. Um, I have, I mean, I have about 20 different directions I want to go in. <laughs> the last, the, actually, the last two that I did are the, the writing ones on this side, um, where I just, I, I just wrote out stuff. And, uh, but again, I stuck it into, I stuck it into Photoshop, and I changed the colors of all the different layers of writing, uh, you know, to see how it all fit together. And then at the very end, I applied just very lightly a filter that kind of um, uh, unified the whole thing, if you will. Um, so, but the drawing was, the, the writing was the basis for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, of course, I love to draw and, and paint. How long would it take me if you had been well, th 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's that's the whole idea. Is that's why I turned to the computer. But you can see that it changes the image. You know, no matter what media you work in, you're, the image is going to be different. Um, but the and it's hard to say whether I. Uh, I mean. A lot of this stuff I've thought before. I mean, it seems familiar to me. Um, Paul McCartney, when he wrote uh, yesterday, he he thought, "Well, this was this is I'm just sort of copying somebody. I mean, this is this is too old. This is just too. It's it's uh, it's it has to have been done by somebody else. It's too simple, and yet." Um, you know the, the his copyright people and all that. They went through all the music and they couldn't find it anywhere. And I kind of feel that way about this stuff. I say, you know, people have got to be, have done this. It's just, it's, it seems, it seems like I've seen it before, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly that old sense of deja vu kind of stuff. Anything else? How much do you see the new emerging technology driving the component of the art versus your traditional media? Um, well, obviously right now I'm, you know, I'm dependent upon a lot of it. Um, but it's, um, I don't want, I don't want to be beholding to anybody, <laughs> if you will. So, um, what I'm doing here, I feel as though I can do anywhere. It would just be different. It just wouldn't look the same. But I could still do the same thing. I could get I could get a couple of tubes of paint and some and a canvas and I can I can make things happen for me. It's just this is more uh, accessible and available to me at the moment. Um, so if I have if I have 15 minutes between classes, I can I can sit there and go doo -doo 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 and play with it.
Anything else? What do you guys think? Which ones? Uh, especially the, the second one. The self-portrait? Uh, okay. I think you're going to benefit heavily from the new audio stereoscopic screens that are coming out that actually will take 2D images and make them 3D. That came out at the CDC this year. They won't hit the consumer market for a couple of years, but that technology is it's yeah. already in existence. Yeah, my steps, uh, my um, son-in-law was uh, um, dealing in a company in California that was doing a lot of that kind of stuff, converting and taking, and they've got, you know, they've got all these programs now that can zip it right out. Yeah. What's the largest you ever projected? Uh, projected? The screen in there. When did you do that? Um, about a month ago, I guess. How's that? Uh, I like it. I like it a lot. Um, I just didn't have the time to develop the images that I wanted to to work to to work that large space. But yes, I like it very much. I mean, as you can see, I like it as big as you can get. Um, I was hoping to use the the TV as a. I think everybody's getting a white image because you're all seeing it in an angle. It's not very good. Huh. Okay. Changes the color a little bit. Does it change the actual depth? Because you're getting so much more than the screen, so much more. Um, hard to say. Hard to say. Um, you'd have to, you really have to look at it because, I don't know, you change anything and the whole thing changes. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's any less or more. You know, um, but it's somewhat proportional. The larger the image, the bigger the depth. That's usually dependent upon your distance from it. You know, but you can have a huge image, and if you're 10 feet from it, you're not going to see any more depth than you are from one of these images, viewing one of these images 10 feet from it. You know what I'm saying? In other words, the size of it—the size of it—doesn't determine the depth. It's the it's the uh, the colors and the distance that determine the depth. But no matter how big you make it, it's just a matter of depth, like this. Or it, depending upon how far you are away, if you're at the same distance away from it as you are to a smaller image, yes. Uh, no, because you can you can set it to uh, you know the resolution and stuff, so it, you don't you you can't see it from that distance. Yes, which is my favorite one. Ooh, I have all sorts of favorite ones. <laughs> um, Oh boy. I don't know how, well, it's hard to say. Using the word enjoyable is a tough one. Because uh, <laughs> making some of these wasn't necessarily enjoyable. Um, it was a lot of work. Um, I think I, I like most of them uh, for different things that happened in them. Um, there are a couple which I'd rather not be showing, which I don't think are very strong. But most of them, I think, are, are fairly strong. And 
and a few of them, a few of them are a little stronger than others. So it, it's hard for me to judge. I don't. I try not to judge my work that way. Okay, well, if you guys don't have anything more. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming.